Welcome to Gurukul Lessons on Early Indian History. I am Professor Smita Sehgal from Lady Shri Ram College History Department. My area of specialization is history of religion, gender studies, and definitely archaeology is my area of interest. Today my theme, which I am going to divide in two parts, is going to be on archaeological sources. We need to really understand the meaning and function of sources before we can delve into it further. What are sources? Sources are the tools with which a historian recreates the past. And sources are generally of two types. Literary sources, which are invariably textual material, and archaeological sources. Both are equally essential in the reconstruction of human past, but friends, you must be aware of the fact that both require human mediation, whether it's literature or archaeology, and we really work with the two together. If I need to compare the two sources, archaeological and literary, we find some differences in that. Though I must acknowledge that we can neither debunk India's rich liter literary heritage nor be dismissive about the significance of archaeological evidence. Now, literary sources give us an insight into human thinking patterns, though I must acknowledge that it can carry certain biases and we get references to just views of a couple of people, but these are important nonetheless. Archaeology, on the other hand, helps us to recreate the material milieu of different phases of history, including pre- and proto-history. I would say even historic period is important, but pre- and proto-history is very, very essential in its recreation through archaeology. Archaeological sources are enduring. They can be easily dated and are hardly corruptible. But at the same time, probably we do not get the first-hand account of human mind, though we have archaeologists and historians to help us out in that. Let us also take a look at the types of archaeological sources there are. There are at least three types, epigraphic, numismatic and material remains. Our focus in the two lectures that we have today is going to be on material remains. Study of material remains requires an understanding of excavations, that is deep digging, and explorations, that is looking for surface, surface finds. I will be talking about it in some detail a little later. But archaeological sources include the study of pottery, sculptural finds, paintings such as rock art, stone tools, habitation sites, building remains, uh, temples, warehouses, and so on. At times, friends, the entire city is dug up. We are able to unearth it and then we study it in detail. Coming to the basic question, what is archaeology? Traditionally, archaeology has been associated with recovery, analysis and interpretation of human past through the study of material remains. All the three phases of human past, and that is prehistory, proto-history and history, can be recreated through archaeological sources. Certainly, archaeology helps in understanding of the historic period, but as I mentioned, the two other periods, that is the prehistory and proto-history, are completely based on archaeological discipline. Now, archaeology is by and large associated with ancient period, but friends, that's really not true because archaeology extends much beyond that into the medieval and the modern phases of history also. And today, goals of archaeology have been enlarged in an effort to learn relationship between material culture and human behavior. In this particular section, I want to bring about a certain kind of conceptual clarity. Friends, we come across so many terms when we are studying archaeology. What do these mean? Let us try and understand that. I want to bring to four difference between prehistory, proto-history and history and also need to explore a little in terms like artifact, industry, assemblage, culture, site and field archaeology. Prehistory. What is prehistory? Now, prehistory refers to that phase of human history when both human beings and the earth were in a stage of evolution and it is marked by humanity's struggle for survival in adverse environment. Well, we can discern a steady progress as we look at various levels in history from animal hunting 
to food producing, uh, to a nomadic existence, to, to, to uh, cattle herding and also at times settled life. I just want to make it clear, it is not always going in a very linear pattern. It is not as if when agriculture has been discovered, you abandon of uh, hunting and gathering. That does not happen. There is a possibility of coexistence also, but we can also discern certain level of development along with it. Now, in the context of Indian history, the earliest period, that is the Paleolithic period, can stretch back to as much as 2 million years ago. What is proto-history? Proto-history is a period when human beings became literate. However, our inability to decipher the records, as happens in the case of the Harappan or Indus civilization, has kept the data which has been retrieved inaccessible in the reconstruction of our past. So, past has to be constructed primarily on the basis of material remains. In the context of Indian history, proto-history is treated as a phase that bridges the gulf between 3000 BCE and 600 BCE. Uh, BCE here refers to before common era. Oral literature was available for the so-called Vedic period. It's a very rich period. We know people were literate. At least a certain section of society was literate. Unfortunately, the written material has not been discovered so far. We are, however, sure that some kind of writing must have been there. Friends, it's true that the earliest retrievable inscriptions that we have belong to Ashokan times. But if we were to read, say, Panini, we get to know so many scripts were already in know of people by the 4th century BCE and every possibility that in the Vedic period also some kind of script on writing was done, but probably on an unenduring material. Finally, what is history? History is that phase of human development for which we have ample records in the form of literary texts and epigraphs. These help to corroborate and cross-examine the archaeological data that has been retrieved and also reinforces our knowledge on human history with a greater level of precision. As mentioned earlier, it gives us an opportunity to peep into the mental processes of human mind. Other terms that one need to be familiar with include artifact, industry, assemblage and culture. What is an artifact? Any portable object made by humans such as a tool or remain of one or such artifact it could be a pottery shirt also. Actually, anything that is worked upon by human being becomes an artifact. For instance, a natural product like a pebble, a stone. If it has been given an edge, a working edge, a flake is taken out of it, a handle is attached to it, becomes an artifact. We also know that if we have some artifacts worked in a particular area, it gives us a sense of an industry. So what is an industry? Similar artifacts of the same material found at a site constitute an industry and these indicate conscious and collaborative human activity. We have examples of this. For instance, we have the blade industry, the burin industry. Now you can take a look at this picture of stone tools. This gives us an idea of a hand axe and a scraper, again going back to Paleolithic time. Microlith industry, you can see there are certain forms. These are flake tools primarily. Very, very small triangles, trapezes, they could be lunates also. And these are composite tools to which a stick may be attached so it can become an, become an arrow. Or if, uh, if, if you have a handle attached to a lunate, it can become a, a sickle. All industries found at a site constitute its assemblage. And with assemblage, we expand a circuit of study. Similar uh, recurring assemblages are found at different sites and these constitute an archaeological culture. According to Gordon Child, the very famous archaeologist, we find certain types of remains, pots, implements, ornaments, burial sites and house forms constantly recurring together. Such a constitute of associated trait is called a cultural group or just a culture. And here when we are talking about a culture, we are really looking at ancient um, archaeological culture. This is a picture actually of an assemblage. This is a rock art assemblage from Middle Orinoco, South America. You can see that there are certain geometrical designs here. But if you see closely, these need not be exactly the same. They can be different when we are talking about assemblage. 
Now, with archaeological culture, we have to be careful whether we can actually make it correspond to a human culture or culture of separate people or ethnic types. Some scholars would say it may be there may be similarity, but more and more scholars have critiqued this because there is hardly any consensus amongst archaeologists on cultural taxonomies. However, we need to remember that time phases of material cultures are slower and longer than historical events and cultures. Archaeological cultures therefore do not coincide with the rise and fall of dynasties. Coming to yet other terms like sites and settlements, what are these? Sites are places where material remains of past activities of human population can be identified. How are these sites discovered? Sites are discovered often through the study of literature. Let me give you an example. When very known archaeologists like Vaidhi Sharma started looking for sites of Mahabharat, what did they turn to? They turned to Mahabharat to figure out where must they start their excavations from. But this can also happen through regional and village surveys or with the help of aerial photography. Sometimes sites are discovered in a very accidental way as happens in the case of Harappa. There was a mount there and people had started taking bricks out of it and that caught attention of Alexander Cunningham. He came across a couple of seals out there and some figurines and wondered if it was an ancient site and finally it was uh, discovered in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, much later 1921, but it was more or less to start with an accidental fight, uh, find. Today, there are sophisticated technologies such as the Landsat satellite created images of the Earth's surface which can assist us in locating archaeological sites. Otherwise, we have underwater metal detectors also that give us a marine uh, give marine archaeologists a sense of sites and settlements buried underwater like that at Dwarka. At Dwarka, in fact, we have got a sense of a port being there, a settlement being there. And again, very interestingly, we have references of it in the literary evidences. Look at this. This is a picture of archaeological site of Mohenjo-daro. It really gives us a sense of an ancient city and city that can go back almost 5,000 years from now, which, which is amazing. Rakhigari, incidentally, there are a couple of uh, interesting sites on the Indian side of the subcontinent also like Rakhigari, Dholavira, Kalibangan. This particular picture is a skeletal remain of Rakhigari. It's a female uh, skeletal remain. Today it is at National Museum, but Rakhigari per se also gives us a sense of a city being there. But not all sites, archaeological sites have to be dug. There are some surface finds also and there are sites on the ground too. And here is a beautiful, well-conserved archaeological site of Sanchi Stupa. Coming again to yet another issue, the topic of field archaeology. Generally speaking, field archaeology deals with exploration and excavation of sites. It involves the use of techniques such as photography, mapping, surveying, digging, sampling, basically removing artifacts with an intent. It is done deliberately. It also includes a laboratory component where initial documentation, analysis and the study of material remains can happen. Explorations are done on site to carefully search for the surface finds at a site and this involves observation without disturbing the physical remains. So many paleolithic tools, friends or mesolithic tools can actually be a part of the surface finds. Excavations on the other hand require digging. The excavations can be horizontal, especially when large surface has to be exposed and if we want to have a sense of cities being there, then explorations are very, very important. But sometimes the sites, in some sites only a sample size area is chosen and a vertical deep digging is done, especially if in those areas where you have people living around. Recording is done simultaneously as excavation result in destruction, especially at the upper, uh, in the, of the upper layers. We have to then immediately 
record them, get to know the precise level at which the artifact was found. We also have to look at other things very carefully. What are the other artifacts found from that uh, layer? Field archaeology also emphasizes the importance of understanding the sites within their larger landscapes and contexts. Let me give you some examples. If you look at the Buddhist sites, especially in the Deccan, you would find most of the Buddhist sites are close to important trade routes. Understandable. Take an example of Kanheri. Kanheri caves which are close to Mumbai and Mumbai itself would be a port area, that site. So there is a possibility that people with affiliation towards Buddhism came to the, to the Kanheri caves, paid their homage, interacted with the monks made some offering and then moved for their oceanic voyage or on their way back again came back to show their thanks. So what I am just trying to say is that you have to look at the larger landscape also along with it. Now friends, another very very important component of archaeology that we all need to be familiar with and that is the techniques, techniques to source and analyze the archaeological data and we start with dating techniques. Friends, there are many dating techniques. I am going to confine myself with just two or three and then also look at some other scientific techniques that are used in the discipline of archaeology. One of the very famous and well known is the carbon 14 dating. It is some, based on the principle that all living things such as human beings, plants, animals contain a fixed proportion of C12 and C14. After the death or decay, while C12 remains stable, C14 decreases at a steady rate and if the ratio between C12 and C14 is studied and calculated, the original date of that organism can also be specified. But there is a caveat there. This can only be used for organic material and also the date that we talk about is tentative. It cannot be really stretched too far back. But there are other techniques also which we can make use for studying the inorganic material. For instance, the thermonulusins, uh, that is TL technique, which is helpful in dating the inorganic objects such as pottery. It is based on the principle that at the time of pottery making, the clay entraps certain min minerals having electrons. If a piece of a particular sample is heated in the laboratory, it will release accumulated energy in the form of light. This can be measured to indicate the period when it was fired or baked first. Along with that, we need to read and study about potassium argon dating also, which is used to determine the age of rocks, measuring the proportion of potassium and argon in the volcanic ash containing prehistoric remains. It helps us to obtain dates for objects as far back as 5 million years ago. There is yet another scientific technique which archaeologists make use of, which is called microware analysis. Microware or useware analysis involves examination of the traces of wear left on stone implements under a microscope. It was developed in 1964 by a Soviet archaeologist Semenov. It really helps an archaeologist to determine the use of a particular tool. For instance, if a stone tool is there, what was it used for? Cutting a piece of wood or bone or meat? We get to know about that. Similarly, we can also use to understand what was the purpose to which a particular pottery was put to use. For instance, was it used to contain uh, a perfumes or liquor or food grains. So it is interesting, by one technique we get to know the age of the pottery and by yet another technique its purpose or the use it has been put to. There are some other scientific techniques also such as plantiology which is the study of the history of life and species on earth as based on study of fossil data and it makes use of molecular bio biology and involves DNA studies and specially gives us an idea if these are fossils gives us an idea of, of the shape of the animals or human beings 
and also their migration pattern. And when this gets combined with faunal analysis, it really helps us to understand the, the faunal remains of animals. It gives us an indication where they were butchered, coked, eaten or whether they were also associated uh, with other practices uh, where they were, were, were they used for the burials, etc. We get to know about that. Paleopathology really helps us in yet another important thing and that is the study of epidemics like say malaria. We know that malaria afflicted people in Mohanjodaro. We also get to know from faunal remains and dental studies the consumption pattern of those people and we get to know whether they were, there was any gender divide in that. I come back to Harappa time and again because from Harappa we have managed to get some kind of data where we get to know that there were animals and there were animals and also human beings if you were to, to say from their burial practices that the average size of a human being especially of a man was 1.67 of, and of a woman 1.5 five meters and if we compare this with the faunal remains of Mesolithic time where we get the, the same material 1.8 meters a male figure and 1.7 meter female we get to know about the gender divide. So friends I am going to wrap up my first section here but I will leave you with thoughts. Thoughts about what kind of history can we retrieve and information we retrieve from archaeology and what kind of practices we make use of to make it more and more intelligible to us. Thank you.